Okay, so welcome back from spring break. Hopefully you had some time to relax. And if you celebrate Easter, happy Easter. Um, so back when you guys did the feedback stuff, one of the feedback items was, oh, it feels like we're slightly behind. By the way, Zoom, is audio good? Um, cool. Um, and at that point, we weren't. Maybe like a lecture at most. Um, but then we had a snow day, so now we're a bit behind. So I'm going to cut out at the very end. We're not going to cover interconnection networks. Um, and I'll, I'll try and skip a couple of the more tangential topics that you weren't going to be tested on anyway. Um, so that's going to be the plan. Uh, I'm still a bit behind on regrade requests, but I will respond to all of them. Uh, so just hang tight on that. I, I don't remember when I said they're due by either Wednesday or Friday um for the exam so if you haven't looked at your exam then do that um and i will also try and get project three and homework four to you over the the next weekend any questions logistics wise okay So uh, today we're going to talk about out of order execution. If I can, there we go. And to do that, we're going to first do a bit of view on in order pipelines and just get a get to orient ourselves to what we're talking about. Hello. There we go. Okay, so here's a, an in-order pipeline. This is kind of one that we've, we've looked at before. We have the fetch decode and then a bunch of different units for doing different types of execution. So this would be an, uh, ooh, ouch. an integer add up at the top, integer to multiply would take a little bit longer. Floating point multiplication takes even longer. And we have our cache miss situation is going to take a long time here. Um, and then we have um, this reorder and then, and then right at the very end. So if we have an in-order pipeline, the biggest problem is that if we have a data dependency, we're going to just have to stall. We can't dispatch any of the younger, that is uh, subsequent instructions until the uh, dependence, dependency is resolved. Um, for clarity, dispatching just means sending whatever the instruction is to its corresponding functional unit, its, its uh, corresponding um, execution pipeline, whether that's floating point or integer or whatever. Now, let's take a look at this in practice. Um, so what did the following two pieces of code have in common with respect to the previous design as far as, uh, uh, as, far as what, what I've described goes? And hint, the red ones are the ones to look at. I mean, it's pretty obvious the blue stuff is the same, so let's ignore that as being common. So on all of these, the ad's going to stall. Why? Well, they have these nasty dependencies here of R3 being required in the addition, and it was loaded in from a load. And then over here, I multiply, as we saw in the previous slide, 
takes longer than a floating uh, than a normal integer operation. So that's also going to stall the pipeline. So that's not cool. Um, one second, let me adjust my mic here. I'll mute so you don't get a deafened. Okay, um, so yeah, the ad is not gonna be able to dispatch. It's not gonna be able to execute. You know, we can, e even with bypassing, we aren't gonna be able to en enter our execution stage until the source registers are available um, after the execution stage of the, of the previous instruction. Um, and not only that, but none of these blue instructions that are independent of R3. You notice that you know, these don't have, uh, they don't use any of the values that were computed up in the first two instructions. So they're in independent. None of those can be executed. Even though technically we could be doing the work on those, at least getting started, we can't write, but we, we can do most of the work on these um, while we're stalled on the, on the second instruction. So, now let's look at the differences between the two because they're they're slightly different um, in one critical area. Any ideas what that critical difference between these two pieces of code is? If you're here in person, try not to look at the grayed out text. I'm I multiply is just integer multiply. LD uses data memory, yeah. And what do we know about memory in general? Specifically, say, I don't know, the cache. Yeah. We don't know if it's gonna be there until we try and get it. Yeah, we might get a miss. So what does that cause? Well, it causes us to have variable latency okay so we don't if it's a cache hit then load is going to be like a cycle or two if it's a cache miss well we're going to be waiting a long time for that to come in right um so we have a, a different uh amount of times that we're going to have to stall depending on a bunch of different factors Integer multiply is going to take a constant amount of time every single time, you know, five cycles or whatever. Now, what does this affect? Well, for integer multiply, we can potentially do some compiler optimizations, spread out our instructions such that we won't ever encounter this. You know, a compiler could do the necessary shuffling of instructions uh, and be pretty, pretty reasonably good at optimizing it uh, for this integer multiply case. But the compiler doesn't know whether or not you're gonna get a cache hit or a cache miss. So it can't solve this runtime problem that we have. So what do we do? Well, if we need something at runtime, let's build it into our architecture. And that's where this out of order execution idea comes in. Now, uh, we've also seen a couple of other, other ways to prevent these, these stalls uh, already. We have seen, for example, fine-grained multi-threading. This is the one where you have a bunch of different thread contexts and you switch between them on each cycle. So this prevents you from ever, ever having a, um, two instructions from the same thread in the pipeline at the same time. We also talked about, as I mentioned before, this compile time scheduling and reordering. So we can just shuffle our instructions around so that it, uh, um, a so, so that we can um, hide the latency of constant time instructions. But there are disadvantages. Um, would it be possible to create an image of the state to come back to when the LD is done. 
Um, so Kyle, the problem is that then the it's it's all the subsequent uh, uh, instructions that matter. I think is is the the problem here. You have to make sure that you handle exceptions correctly. You have to make sure that you handle a bunch of uh, just control dependencies and such. Um, so that's not really necessarily a viable option. Okay, so the disadvantages, um, if you recall, for for the first one, are that uh, with fine green multi-threading, you need to have a bunch of threads, at least enough to fill up your pipeline, right? If you don't, then well, you can't take advantage of it. And then uh, anything that's compile time isn't runtime. So if it's a compile time reordering, then that's not going to help you if it's a runtime problem. So it's not going to help with the case where you don't know if it's a cache miss or a cache hit. So, uh, I mean, hopefully by the slide deck title, it's kind of obvious what we're going towards, but any ideas for what we could potentially do to improve this? Is this considering bypass? Great question. Uh, yes, it is. So even with a bypass, uh, if there's a true data dependency between the, the you know, say instruction one and instruction two, you're going to, you're guaranteed to have to stall at least some until the execution phase is over. Um, you know, best case, only a cycle or two, right? Worst case, you have a cache miss and you just have to wait for an eternity. Great question. So th this is including bypassing, right? Um, we can't do anything though. If we can't even bypass if we don't have the data yet from a load, for example. So we're going to look at this idea of outer or out of order execution. It's also called dynamic scheduling, and the idea is that let's try and do dependent instructions. Um, uh, and kind of separate them from these independent instructions in, in a sense. Um, so say that we have the previous example, right? We could go ahead and uh, move that add kind of out of the way, allow the other ones to start going. And then once the load or integer multiply is done, then we can bring that in and execute that dependent instruction. Now, uh, this is a little bit difficult, we're going to see, um, because we're going to have to handle exceptions correctly, but we have ways of handling that. What this allows us to do, though, is do some useful work, or at least potentially useful work, assuming that the previous instructions don't error. Uh, we can do this potentially useful work and uh, while we're waiting for a high latency instruction to finish. We're going to see that the idea here is that we have this kind of rest area concept where we store dependent instructions until they're ready to actually be executed or dispatched. So in this rest area, what we're going to do is we're going to monitor the values that each instruction needs. So when we put, for example, that add into the rest area, so to speak, we're going to say, hey, this needs, what was it, R3 or whatever. And when all the source values are available, then we can send it to the execution units. What does this give us? Well, it gives us latency tolerance. We're allowed to do these independent instructions um, while some long latency instruction is happening. OK. Any questions?
this kind of like branch delay slots? Is this kind of like branch delay slots? Yes. Except for this is more general. Okay. There's no the, ordering restriction. Well, so first of all, this branch delay slots are a compile time thing. And okay. uh, that's the that's the biggest difference between this and branch delay slots, but it's a very similar concept. We're trying to to do something useful while we're waiting for something to resolve. Um, okay. So this is not done via the compiler. We can't, for, uh, we, we can do some things via the compiler. We could reorder instructions so that, for example, we, we separate the add and the multiply by a few instructions so that we have less latency there. But this is done entirely independent of the compiler. You could just give it an optimized code and it'll try and optimize it for you by reordering things at runtime, okay? Yeah, so this is a microarchitectural solution to this problem. And as I said, as I mentioned, it's more general because it, it, it handles more things than just a branch. Um, we can do things like integer multiply, floating point multiply, uh, you know, loads, stores. I guess stores don't really matter as much, but okay. So Let's look at what this gives us. So this is kind of a high level overview of, of how this helps. So say that we have in order dispatch. So we're executing each instruction one by one in order. And we also want to have precise exceptions. So we'd never want to write before something is, is guaranteed to, you know, that's the, that's the state. Um, we don't, for example, if this one, if one of these up here errors, oh, uh, like this one here, we don't want to write until we don't want to write any of the later ones. We want to kill the pipeline. If this one errors, then we want to kill those. So anytime that you see this need for precise exceptions, what you should look for is that these writes are kind of in a line uh, down here. Uh, we don't have any overlapping or any rights before of, pre of later instructions before previous ones. Okay, so going back to our example, we have our integer multiply, uh, and then we're going to take four cycles for that. Notice that we are doing bypassing, so we're going from the end of this execution stage to the beginning of the next execution stage, which is this add R3, R1 into R3. So we are doing bypassing, but it still didn't really, you know, it still caused us to stall three. You know, luckily, you know, we didn't have to stall another one for this one or this one, but we still have to stall. Uh, and then that forces the entire pipeline to stall. We can't do any work on anything because these are after this instruction. We, we, we were not able to. Um, get started even decoding this one until uh, this cycle here. What is it? Uh, cycle cycle seven. And notice this one's totally independent, right? This doesn't this doesn't even touch uh, the R three value that was computed up here. Then we do this instruction down here again. Uh, this one's computing R five this time, and it's it's gonna, again, cause a stall in the next instruction, which also depends on R5. So what is the out of order sequence of instructions? So we, I haven't even specified it yet. I'm, we're just kind of looking at the, the diagram of when they would be executing. Um, Okay. Now, what we can do is we can get rid of these stalls. And instead of having to, for example, stall down here and, and just do no work in this uh, on the third instruction for three cycles, we can go ahead and get started on it. We, we won't do the right, but we can get started and do all the rest of the stuff 
um, while we're waiting for the uh, um, the integer to multiply on this first cycle here. Also, we can start doing some work on the fourth instruction while we're waiting for this first in, first instruction to uh, complete as well. So that's pretty handy, right? We've gotten rid of a ton of, uh, of, of latency here just by allowing some of these things to go forward. We still, again, as, as you can see, have this uh, stair step write stage at the end, uh, which guarantees that we won't ever write something that we don't want to write. So what does this do? Well, just from the diagram, we can see that we've so we we still have to wait on these two instructions, right? Um, but these two independent instructions are what really help. These these ones are going to be able to go and execute and not cause additional latency uh, while while this one's being executed. And we go down from uh, 15 cycles down to 12. So that's pretty nice. All right. Any any questions on this diagram? Okay, so what does the first instruction have three E's, but the second only has one? Ah, yeah, so that's because we have variable length um, execution stages for these different instructions. Energy multiply is going to take more cycles than an add. Okay. So I, I want to review data dependencies. These are critical to keep track of whenever we start reordering things, because we have to maintain all of these dependencies even through our reordering. So first of all, we have um, our read after write. So we're reading a value after we've written to it. We have to make sure that those go in order still. We have a, a write after read. So we're writing to a value after we've read from it. If we, for example, reorder these two instructions and had uh, this one go before this one, that would be bad, right? Because we would, we would be reading the incorrect value on this instruction. We also have a write after write dependency, where we do a write after we've already written to that same location. Um, so these are the three dependencies that we have to keep in mind as we're doing any reordering. So the, the way that we're gonna do, go about this is we're gonna kind of try and get rid of some dependencies by renaming. Um, so we can get rid of it uh, if we, for example, renamed or put into R6 instead of R1 here, we would get rid of a right after right dependency, which is pretty nice because then we don't have, if there's no dependency, there's no problem. Um, so with this rename, we have an add instruction that that writes to R1, it takes an R2 and R3. And then we have another add instruction, which goes to R1, and it takes R5, R4 and R5. So let's just, instead of writing to R1 on this instruction, let's write to R6. Seems reasonable. Assuming that R6 hasn't been used, let's just assume that for now. But what happens when we get another instruction? Say we have an instruction that's uh, uh, add R1 plus R5, and we put it into R8. Well, we can't just copy this over because we would change the value that's being used by this addition. 
uh, we, we have to also rename this variable here, which gives us add of uh, R8 and then or add into R8, R6 plus R5. So this is the idea of register renaming. We're gonna do this on the fly uh, and kind of just assign new values to uh, each of these different um, registers so that, so that we can start avoiding some of our data dependencies. So let's look at the mechanics of how uh, this works. Now, our pipeline is more complicated. We have the same fetch and decode stages, but now we have this schedule phase where we kind of determine which uh, instructions we can execute. Will the compiler rename registers or the processor? So it, it's the processor. You, so it, th this is somewhere, you know, these, these, the previous slide had some register renames that were pretty easy to just do it as a compiler level. But uh, in an out of, out of order processor, we're gonna have that done at the architectural level as well. So, um, you know, it could be a kind of a team effort, but um uh the processor will do this automatically great question any other questions so uh our scheduler will basically keep track of which instructions can be executed which instructions have their dependencies resolved and it'll fire it off into these various execution units and then at the very end, we have a reorder stage where we make sure that our writes are in the correct order. We handle stuff like exceptions. Um, at this point, you know, we would just flush our reorder buffer at the end if we have an exception. Uh, and then we just do a write at the end. Okay, so we kind of have this. Uh, this part of the pipeline as in order. So we're fetching in order. And this part over here, after we've reordered, we're doing the write in order. So both bookends of our instructions are in order. What is not in order is actually executing the various instructions uh, for, for this uh, program. So let's look at how we might implement this. First of all, a huge key to all of this is that we need good branch prediction. So we need to know which instructions to fetch because if we wanna do stuff out of order, we're going to have to fetch more than one instruction. We're gonna have to fetch, let's say five instructions in the future so that we can kind of reorder them in a way that helps us. And if we have bad branch prediction, then we're screwed. We're gonna just like fetch instructions that are useless and we'll try and reorder them and then have to throw them away. So this all relies on having a great branch predictor giving us, let's just say 90% or above uh, accuracy. Now, once we fetched our instructions, they go into this instruction queue. So here's our instruction fetch queue. So again, uh, this is just an expansion on our kind of more basic pipeline where we fetch a single instruction at once. Now we're fetching a bunch of instructions. In this case, we're fetching five uh, into our fetch queue. So we have a, uh, uh, an add where we go R1 plus R2 into R1. R1 plus R3 into R2, then we have a branch uh, equal to zero on R2. And then, you know, because we have good branch prediction, we are going to most likely then after the branch be executing these two instructions where we add R1 
plus R2, we put that into R3, and then this one down here, R3 plus R2 into R1. So we fetched our instructions, then we do our decode stage. On our decode stage, we are not only going to decode the instructions, we're also going to do this register renaming. So now our decode stage is way more complicated, right? So all of this obviously comes at a cost. And the cost is more hardware, uh, bigger penalties for misprediction, for example, um, and stuff like, uh, um, you know, it, it's more just general complexity. But if we can gain some performance out of this, that's, that's uh, potentially a really good thing. Okay, so what does this decode stage do? Well, first of all, what comes after the decode stage generally in a, in a, in a basic pipeline would be just the straight off execution stage. But now we're, we're putting our execution stage over here and we have a, a kind of a, a bit of a holding area um, before the execution stage, which has two components. We have our reorder buffer and we have our issue queue. Over here is our registers, our register files up here. We're just gonna, you know, we can, we can it, it's just like we've, we've seen before. Now, uh, one nice thing is, let's just say we have a multi, uh, we could also have multiple execution lanes for our ALUs. So we could have, this is one advantage where, you know, if we have, if we're fetching multiple instructions, we can potentially be dispatching multiple instructions at the same time in the same cycle to a, our execution stage. But um, let's, uh, let's ignore that for now. That makes it more complicated. So what is the advantage of renaming? Well, let's look and look at, uh, uh, at this example. I think it'll kind of help clarify. So what, what happens? We go here, we take our first instruction, which is R1 plus R2 into R1. And instead of writing to R1, we're going to write to T1. So this temporary kind of fake register or temporary register. But it's not like the MIPS temporary register, it's a architectural temporary register that you don't even know about. And we have, uh, it's kind of in our reorder buffer, more or less. That's where we're writing it to. Um, so what happens down here? The next instruction, it depends on R1. Now, if we don't rename it, then it's going to be pulling the wrong value. So it's going to be pulling uh, from the register file instead of the temporary register that we want it to be pulling from. So we have to do a rename. We're having to rename this from T1, or sorry, from R1 to T1. Also, we're going to rewrite it, uh, its output to T2. Now, we look at the next instruction, which is this branch equal to zero. Um, and it depends on R2. Again, we renamed that, so we're going to have to go ahead and, and rename it in our, re, in our issue queue. And for all of these, we're going to you know, allocate uh, temporary registers to, to store their, their results. Now we come down here, we have R1 plus R2, um, and we're gonna rename those to T1 and T2. And then we have our T4 over here, uh, which is the output of this. And then again, R3 just got renamed to T4, so we have to rename it down here. And then R2 was renamed up here. Uh, so we're gonna have to rename that to T2. And then we put it out into, R, uh, into T5. So what does this allow us to do? Well, we can execute any of these instructions at any time. Any instruction that's in our issue queue, as long as 
all of its dependencies are met, we can send it to the ALU. So let's see here. Um, I mean, this isn't a, a great example of a piece of code where you could do this, but um, you know, let's just say that we had a, a sixth instruction down here, which only relied on the value of T1. So it only relied on R1. Maybe it was just R1 plus R1 goes into R7 or something like that. As soon as this instruction finished, we could go ahead and dispatch the next instruction, uh, the, that sixth instruction, uh, and go ahead and, and let it do its work, even though all the other ones are kind of just waiting for various things to resolve. Obviously, this second instruction could also be executed at that same time. So we, we could, if we, again, like I said, if we have multiple streams for execution, we can send them both down the ALUs at the same time. And what this allows us to do, again, the entire point of this is to hide latency of long latency instructions by doing something else while we're waiting on them. Um, and that something else is going to be some other instruction that we pull out of our issue queue. Again, it's one of the things that this issue queue has to do is keep track of when values become available. So that's again more complexity, but you know it's it's doable. You know it's it's going to be like a, a valid bit or something in our reorder buffer with with, uh, with an indicator of of whether or not a, a registers a temporary register is available. Okay, uh, I feel like that was kind of a lot. So any any more questions? Cool. So let's let's do an exercise in this and do an actual uh, rename where we have four temporary variables or temporary registers. Four rename registers. Okay. So um, let me. I'll pull this up and you guys can get started if you'd like, but we'll, we'll go through this pretty much together. Oh dear. Uh, the, the first thing that I would make sure to do is, is keep track of your dependencies. So you see a bunch of uh, R1, right? We're going to have to deal with all those. You see R3 is used a bunch of places as well. So you're going to have to make sure to handle those as well. Um, just make sure that you keep track of all of them. If you rename, uh, for example, this here, you're going to have to rename everything subsequent as well. Okay. Now, let me pull this up over here. Okay, so where's my cursor? There it is. What are we going to have to do with this first instruction? 
according to what we did back in the reorder buffer on the previous slide. Turn it into a T. Yeah, so this is going to go into our rename register instead of into the register file. So let's rename this to T, to T1. Yep, great, Why? exactly right. Now, like I said, that's going to have to cascade down. Oh, did I copy this? I might have copied this wrong. Let me just check, make sure that I didn't do something wrong. Nope, that looks looks right. Unfortunately, all these are like really easy to typo, you know. Let me check over here. Yeah, okay, cool. So let's propagate our our uh, our rename down through the rest of the instructions. We don't have any R1 here what we do in this branch. So we're gonna to have to rename this one T. And then down here, we also uh, have a bunch of renames, but let's, let's pause for just a second here. Let's only do the reads or only do the first read here because we're gonna then write into uh, R1. So we'll, we'll figure that out in just a minute. So let's rename the, that read at least, okay? So now we go up to the second add instruction. And again, you know, there, there's no dependency on this T. So we can just leave these values as they are. Uh, we'll pull those straight from our register file instead of going to the temporary re rename uh, registers. But uh, it's a write, right? So we're gonna have to rename this to one of our rename uh, registers. And we'll go with T2. Okay. Again, let's propagate this down until uh, at least some of the way. So here's a read of R3, and we don't do any writes of it until down here. So let's go ahead and we'll just rename all of these um, because, you know, th this. R3 value isn't going to be changing any time between uh, this add instruction that we just renamed and, and this add instruction down here. So all three of these can be renamed. T2. Okay. Any questions of what we've done so far? All right, so let's go to this branch instruction. Uh, we can see that it's, we've already renamed that was from this R1 rename, so nothing to do. Now let's come down here to this instruction, uh, this fourth instruction. What are we going to have to do here? We've renamed the inputs already. Rename the R1, yeah. So we're gonna have to rename this R1 as well. So we have three rename registers. So this will go into T3. Oh, okay. So now we've taken T1 and T2 and put it into T3. Notice that we're no, no longer even pulling from our 
uh, register file anymore. We're pulling straight from our uh, kind of holding area, uh, our reorder buffer. And oh, but like, I just want to clarify as well, like, um, when your um, when an instruction is in is ready to be retired, so it's the oldest instruction in our reorder buffer, we can go ahead and send it back to the register file. So once it's done executing, we can send it straight to our register file. Um, and then further instructions don't have to go to the temporary register, they can go to the register file directly. Um, okay. I thought all R1s had to be renamed to T1. It looks like that is not the case. That's, that's true, yeah. So kind of all of the ones that are going to be, uh, all of the R1s, where um, it, it's a bit difficult. Like all this is kind of, you know, we, we have to entirely uh, get rid of any, um, we have to entirely co commit the transaction that writes to R1 before we can stop using that, that rename. Um, so, you know, that, that is gonna be, and, and we can't throw away the rename until there's nothing in, in our buffer, in our, uh, in, instruction queue that needs that temporary register. So there's a lot of logic that has to go into this. But let's just, we'll just say that all these are coming in at the same time. So we're gonna rename all of them and just make it easy on ourselves. But yeah, that's a great question and you are right. It is not a, it, with, rename registers separate rename registers um we are not going to permanently rename registers only for temporarily uh to to help us uh uh get past any data dependencies so would we need a separate rename buffer that maps register names to temp register names Uh, so Alec, we, we aren't finished yet. So we'll, 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 we will get to those. Um, and then Ethan, so that's kind of the job of, so, so the, where is it? This one, the reorder buffer kind of has to keep track of, of this mapping of register names temp um, or kind of the rename stage I, i'm not it, it's you know this this all kind of happens at the same time so it's i i'm not sure exactly which piece necessarily keeps track of it but it, it's kind of in the decode stage that this is being tracked great questions by the way um so let's go back to over here because we aren't done renaming um we uh, we renamed this T3, but that used to be R1, right? So we're going to have to change all of the subsequent R1s uh, to T3 until we write to R1 again. Now we write to R1 in the next instruction. So we're going to have to uh, go ahead and uh, we only have one R1 that's going to be read or written again. So we have to rename this one because we have to pull it from the correct value again. We'll pull it from the correct place. Valid C3. All right, so what do we have to do here?
Yeah, so we can we can make this one T4. Exactly. Okay. Now let's look at this instruction. Do we have to do anything here in light of what we just did in the previous instruction? Yeah. We have to rename R1 again. Yeah. Okay. Now, last thing to do, where do we put the output of this add? Yeah, we're going to put it back into T1. Again, this is going to take more circuitry to make sure that T1 is actually available, right? So this is just a, another thing that we're going to have to deal with. Should we leave it R1 so the result goes back to R1? Who is responsible for making sure T4 is written to R1? Great questions. Um, so no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't leave it as R1. We're always going to write to our reorder buffer. And then basically it's, it's kind of the reorder buffer's job, if you will, to, to know when a temporary register should be rewritten back to the actual register file. The way that it knows is that if it's the oldest instruction and it has its value, then it can go ahead and be sent to the register file. If it's, uh, not the oldest instruction and it has its value, then it just stays there in the in the reorder buffer and waits until it becomes the oldest instruction, then it can be written over to the register file. Does that answer your question? Uh, why T4 and not T3? Which, which one? Line eight. Oh, great question. So why do we have to rewrite to a new one here? Well, this is because once we send it to our uh, 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 instruction queue, any of those instructions can be executed at any time. And if we, um, we might end up in a situation where we accidentally execute this instruction, uh, this instruction on uh, line eight, before we execute the instruction on line seven, and that would be bad, right? So, so what we're doing with this temporary register is avoiding that situation by not writing to the same place. So we get rid of our write after write dependency by writing somewhere different. Again, if there's no dependency, there's no problem with you know, different orderings, for example. Great question, by the way. And then why do we output it back to T1? So this is, again, a kind of we're just wrapping around. We ran out of reorder or rename registers. Um, so we're going to have to write it back to our T. Um, correct this gets rid of a lot of the dependencies but not all of them. yeah exactly um and you know we're still going to have to wait uh potentially if you know if, if one of these are instead of an add it's a multiply or something we're going to have to wait for that. So, you know, but because we have this reorder um, idea, we can kind of do something useful in the meantime. Okay, other questions. These are great questions.
So what if instead of um, instead of having a separate uh, like rename registers, what if we just made all of the registers rename registers, kind of have like a virtual registers and physical registers idea? Well, good news, that's possible, and let's talk about it. So instead of having these temporary uh, uh, um, registers kind of stored along with various instructions, what we're going to do is we're just going to expand the number of physical registers we actually have. So say we expand it by four. So now we have four, uh, uh, sorry, 36 physical registers, but the architecture only provides an abstraction for 32. Okay. One thing that, that we're, that we're going to have to do is keep track of the mapping then. So, um, you know, we're going from a, 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 an architectural, you know, ISA register to a physical in hardware register. So that's going to be a, a challenge for us. But, you know, that's, that's totally doable. All of these things, you know, you just add more buffers, more maps effectively. And it just kind of, um, Again, all this comes at a cost of more complexity, but you know, especially, especially if you're able to do a bunch of instructions while you're waiting for a load, that can really, really help performance. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the idea. We're going to have 36 physical registers um, and then only 32 architectural re registers that are exposed via the ISA. So let's see how this would uh, uh, change our renaming process. So uh, I'll, I'll switch back over here. So the first thing about this is that uh, because you know these R R one R two R threes, these no longer refer to physical registers and hardware. They're re referring to this kind of abstraction on top of the physical registers. So we're going to actually have to do a total rename of all of these to physical registers. Um, and I'll just I'll just go ahead and do this uh, to kind of show you what I mean. So the the two reads are going to come out of instead of R R2 and R3 are going to come out of uh, P2 and P3, standing for physical register two and physical register three. Okay. And then um, instead of writing to R1 or P1, we're going to still have this kind of concept of, of allocating a new register for all of our writes. Um, but it's just in the same register file. We, we don't have any distinction between, oh, these are the temporary ones, these are the actual ones. Now they're just all the same and we're just gonna like kind of go in a round robin. Whenever one becomes available, it'll become a temporary one, etc. So this one we're gonna rename to physical 33. So this is the 33rd register. Um, again, this wouldn't be exposed to the architecture to, you know, via MIPS or anything, but this is the underlying implementation. Okay, so uh, well, I chose 33 because it's after 32. So I'm assuming that all the other ones are used up. But like, you know, this is a pretty sanitized example, right? Obviously, if if P15 was the one that was available, we would just use that. Great question. Yeah, uh, this all, um, you know, um, this all is assuming that we're kind of in a base state where we haven't renamed anything yet. All right, so let's, let's go instruction by instruction and we'll kind of look back to previous instructions. What can we do with the second ad here? Or what do we need to do? Well, 
Well, I still see. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna. I still see ours, right? So we're gonna have to change all of them. The first one, which is the destination, as you said, P thirty four. So a new register. Oops. And then these ones are gonna just be renamed to their corresponding P registers. Okay, great. Exactly, kind of like what we did in the previous one. Now let's look at this uh, branch instruction. What do we have to do here? It's referencing R1. Where did R1 go? Or where was it computed? Yeah, so it got renamed to P33, exactly, yeah. So down here, we're gonna use P33. So effectively we have this mapping that says, whenever the ISA requests R1, this is gonna be P33, kind of. So we've, we've handled the first three instructions. What about this next instruction? Let's look at the operands first. So R1, what do we have to do with this? P33? Yep, exactly. What about this second operand, R3? P34. So why does this have to be P34? Well, Let's go back to our actual code here, and you notice that it's R3. And we wrote to it up in this instruction, but we did a rename. So this goes to P34 on the second instruction. So we have to use that down here. Okay, so we've handled the operands, we have to uh, also handle the output and we just put it in the next one. So P35. Okay, well, next instruction now. What do we, what do, we do here? Uh, what does architect mean? Uh, basically, it means the registers that are exposed to the ISA. So you're writing MIPS code, you could reference R1 through 32. But actually, what's happening under the hood is you have six, 36 physical registers. It just pretends to be, you know, 32. Does that mean like the wraparound just happens on the, those four access registers? Yeah, the wraparound kind of happens on those four access registers. And for example, um, you know, it, it may it may be kind of any register that becomes available at any given time. Right? So um, for example, right here, P34 is kind of useless at this point. We used it down here, or sorry, P33, because this was what R1 used to be. So this used to be R1, now we renamed it to P33, we used it here, we used it here, but then we're overriding because this was an add into R1. So P33 would technically be available here, but let's, let's forget about that so we don't confuse ourselves. Um, we can come back to it later, you know, and, and down, the, down the road, that would be an available uh, instruction. Okay, so we renamed um, R1 to P35, so we're going to have to do this rename down here, P35, and then this one still. We haven't written to P33 
P34, or we haven't written to R3, which is mapped to P34. So we can keep it as just P34. And note that we're writing to R1. R1 is an architected register, so we have to map that to a physical one. So let's just use P36. That's the next one that's available. And again, as, as Jason was mentioning, how do we know when like things become available? Well, P35 just became available. We don't need it anymore. It's no longer mapped, you know, the, the mapping from R1 to a physical register no longer includes, goes to P35, it goes to P36. So it, it would become available for subsequent reams. Okay, so um, then we continue, we go on to the next one. Again, this is another rename. So this one's P36 now instead of P35. And then we're going to put it, well, let, let's come back to this in a minute. Um, R3, again, this is the same thing that we saw above. This can come from P34. We can just pull it uh, because it hasn't been written, overwritten. And, um, uh, you, you know, most assuming that kind of all of our physical registers initially mapped to uh, all of our R registers initially mapped to their corresponding P register, register one would be available at this point because we overrode kind of it by by this one that the mapping is now to P33. So uh, P1 is available as an as an option to to do a mapping to. So we can go ahead and, and rename this to, to P1 instead of uh, R3. Oh, that was not a three, or that was not a one, that was a three. Okay. And let's see here. So what about this last instruction? Well, first of all, we have to let you know. Uh, let's figure out which physical register we can go to. Which ones are available at this point? P33 would be available, but there was one that became available before P33. Yeah, so since R3 was mapped to P3 and then we overrode what R3 is mapped to, we can use P3 for this one. We can't use P2 because that hasn't been re, that, that mapping hasn't been moved. So that would be really bad if we if we had oh you know mapped uh, R four also to the same physical register. Aliasing aliasing on the register level is very bad. So P three, yeah. Um, and then we just overrode R three. That's now P one. And. What is R1? Where do we compute R1? Um, let's see. We computed it on this instruction. Oh, it's now P36. Okay, so pretty easy. All right, questions on how this works.
Yes. Why did we do P1 and P3 instead of P33 and 34? Well, so P34 we can't use because it hasn't been remapped yet. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's true. The reason is we're just kind of going in you know, we would kind of put our available ones in a in a queue, if you will. It, it's kind of arbitrary. Um, this is just kind of probably the easiest thing to keep up track of mentally, at least. Um, at an architectural level, you know, it wouldn't necessarily matter. Yeah, so so we could have used we could have used both of those and been totally fine. But I, I think this is good to illustrate kind of what's what's going on. Um, yeah, great question. How do you know when the physical register is freed? Well, so basically when you write to it, then, then that, uh, um, that physical register becomes available. Like, okay, so how to say this? So here on P30, we write, this was an add into R1. So R1 used to be mapped to P33. Now R1 is mapped to P35. So P33 would kind of be available at that point. Now you have to be careful, you know, because you're gonna, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of things to keep track of here, but that, that would be the idea. Um, I think you also have to make sure that you don't have any instructions that are reading from the same value as well. That would be important. Because like if you had further instructions down here that are also reading from P33 or something, uh, still, still in your queue. Because um, again, we're able to execute out of order, so that's possible. Okay. Um, more questions? So I'm going to very, very briefly introduce what we're going to talk about next. Will worksheet 10 be due on Friday? Yes. Uh, it's not a great scope because I haven't put it there. I'll put it out, out there. Um, we're gonna talk about main memory next. This is off chip memory. So uh, we have our processors, we have our main memory, and then way off in the distance, we have our storage. Um, I'll talk about these a little bit more in detail later, but uh, um, where, wait, where's the pictures? Where'd I put the pictures? Well, I put the pictures somewhere. Yeah, so the I, this is kind of an image of a, of a core inside of one. And then the key is that we have this, uh, this DRAM interface. This is what we're gonna talk a lot about. Uh, and then it goes out to external chips. You can see this, this is my computer at home. The CPU is under this massive cooling fan. Ignore the dust. This is why I was opening up the case. But you can see the RAM is over here. It's not in the CPU. It's a, it's off on the motherboard. So we're going to have to figure out. You know, th this is th this is why it's costly to go out to RAM. Uh, we're having to go across a bus on our on our on our uh, motherboard. Um, and then over here is the the SSD. Which is even slower, and then over here is PCI slot, which is even slower. So that's what where we're going. Sorry to keep you a minute late. Um, I will be at office hours in just a couple of minutes, and I'll stick around for questions as well. As well.